Okay, so it is uh, my 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 pleasure to introduce Amanda to the uh, to the to all my colleagues back in Egypt. Uh, uh, Amanda is uh, my partner here in Kentucky. She trained uh, in New Orleans for residency and in Colorado for fellowship. She has a special interest in pediatric oncology. She's a member of COG. Uh, and uh, she's going to share with you this uh, uh, her uh, talk on uh, genital urinary abdomensarcoma. Um, uh, thank you, Amanda, for uh, putting this together. Um, and I guess we can get started. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. And um, I guess I, I think that I probably made it when Z has um, introduced me to all of his friends and trusts me to, to lecture and, and talk to everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about GU rhabdomyosarcoma today. Um, let's see. First thing that I, I will definitely preface this by is that this is probably going to be a little bit COG centric um, because that's what we practice here in Kentucky given our location, but I am going to try to talk about some PSYOP aspects to this as well. So we're, we're going to have three objectives today. The first is to differentiate and, different, and identify the differences between favorable and non-favorable site G rhabdomyosarcoma to review important concepts for the diagnosis and staging, and then discuss the role of surgery within really a multidisciplinary care um, team for rhabdomyosarcoma. So in the US, there's about 350 new cases of rhabdomyosarcoma in a year. And about a quarter of these are GU in origin, so just under 100 cases. 20% are metastatic at diagnosis, and the most likely site of spread really is the lungs, the lymph nodes, and the bone marrow. And those are the things that we're, we're really looking for at our initial staging. About three quarters of all GU rhabdomyosarcomas have occurred by age five. Okay, so this is really um, something that affects younger children, and it, there's a male predominance. This may be because of the prostate being uh, a structure that doesn't exist in females and that being a common site of origin for rhabdomyosarcoma. Age is a risk factor. So patients on the extremes, so less than one and greater than 10 years of age, they have a lower event-free survival compared to those between age one and nine years. When it comes to risk factors, prior radiation or exposure to alkylating agents can increase risk. There are several genetic syndromes that can predispose you to rhabdomyosarcoma. So leaf from many. Um, this is really something that's more common in the young patients. Neurofibromatosis type one, which we may be seeing patients for other reasons. And back with Wiedemann, which we often will see patients either with Wilms tumors or with this syndrome that we're screening for Wilms tumors as well as Noonan syndrome. Um, recent uh, investigations into DICER-1 mutations have also revealed that rhabdomyosarcoma is something that's common here in addition to multilocular cystic nephroma and ovarian and testicular stromal tumors. So the clinical presentation, really I'm gonna try to cover all of kind of pelvic rhabdomyosarcomas. And you need to be thinking about this when you see patients with hematuria urinary obstruction or stranguria, constipation, and extrusion of, a, of tissue or vaginal discharge. When we come to paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma, this presents a little differently. This is typically a painless scrotal mass. So these are two pictures of patients um, that I saw actually as a fellow. This is a bladder rhabdomyosarcoma, and then this was a huge, very difficult to differentiate if this was originating from the bladder or the prostate actually. So one of the most confusing things I think with rhabdomyosarcoma is what I've called the lingo. So there are several things that we talk about. One is site, being favorable or unfavorable. Stage, this is based on a TNM system like we, we see for lots of other cancers. And this is really assigned preoperatively. 
group, which is really where surgeons come into play and, and our completeness of resection before chemotherapy. It can be in multiple trips to the operating room or a single trip to the operating room, but this is where we are really, really important to the grouping of these patients. And then histology, alveolar versus embrinal. And then using all of these things together, a risk is assigned to the patient, either low, intermediate, or high. So first, let's start with site classification. So unfavorable sites would be the bladder prostate, the urachus, or a primary retroperitoneal site of rhabdomyosarcoma. When we talk about favorable, these are our vaginal, uterine, vulvar, or female GU um, organs, or the paratesticular site. So when we look, this is overall including non-GU rhabdomyosarcomas. The most favorable is the orbit, or, or head and neck the GU sites as far as the, the female genital tract and the paratestis, GU, bladder, prostate, urachal, retroperitoneal, and then even worse, we've got the perimeningeal, other, and extremity sites. So stage. So this is the TNM system, and this is assigned preoperatively, okay? So this is kind of a complicated slide, but I wanted to include it because I know for me, I have, um, I have a, a picture in my phone that I've saved as a favorite so that when I see these patients, I can quickly refer to it to look at the staging. What we see here is that site is involved in staging, which is something that's a little bit different from most other TNM staging systems. So if you have a female genital tract or a paratesticular um, primary, you may be stage one. They're the only two sites that can be stage one as far as what we see as um, urologists or in the genitourinary site. If you have nodal disease or a large tumor, so this would be B denotes a size greater than five centimeters, you have to be stage three, and then anyone with metastatic disease is stage four. So when, I, when I'm teaching the residents about this, I, I try to give them tips to break this down and make it a little bit simpler than this overwhelming new staging system. So bladder prostate rhabdomyosarcoma is considered an unfavorable site. So it cannot be stage one ever, all right? And paratesticular and female genital tract, those are favorable sites. So they can only be stage one or stage four. They can't be two or three. All right, so at least on a test, if you have to answer the question, you can narrow down your guesses. When it comes to group, this is really based on the completeness of resection and the nodal status before chemotherapy starts. A little bit later, I'm going to get into um, kind of a pretreatment re-excision and, and delayed primary excision and, and how that relates. So there's more to come on this. But the important, the important timing is the initiation of chemotherapy. And this should be assigned or suggested by the surgeon at the time of resection, okay? So very quickly, I'm going to go through this. So group one is localized disease that's completely resected, no regional lymph nodes involved. In group two, you have, you completely resected, but there was regional spread, either to some organs that you completely excised or the lymph nodes that you completely excised. Group three, this is really the most important part, especially for bladder prostate rhabdomyosarcoma. So this is an incomplete resection and you know there is gross residual disease left. So this can be done after biopsy only, which is often what is done for bladder prostate, or after a gross resection of more than half the tumor. And then when you talk about group four, you, you talk about distant METs. So um, we will get into this, but if you are ever in a situation where you can easily access lymph nodes, okay, so if you're doing for some reason an open biopsy on, let's say, a bladder mass or a, a, a prostate mass, if you can take lymph nodes, it's a very, very good idea to do that and something that you have to think about before because you only have that opportunity while you're in the operating room, okay? So let's say, for example, that we have a three-year-old boy who's got a bladder prostate rhabdo and has no metastatic disease, so clinically localized disease. We know that he can't be stage one because that is only for paratestis and for the female parts, and he will require chemotherapy after his tissue diagnosis. So what we have to think about as the surgeon is how do we get the tissue for the oncologist? Well, if we biopsy only, we make him group 3A. This mandates he will get additional therapy as local control. In the United States for COG protocols, that's radiation. And that comes with risks of radiation cystitis, malignant, secondary malignancies, 
bowel issues, etc. We know about all of those. So you may say, okay, well, let's, why don't we try to just resect this all completely up front? And, you know, if you get a negative margin, you do make the patient group two, which is great. However, you've also exposed them to urinary diversion, infer infertility, likely erectile dysfunction, and other issues with, you know, a reconstructed bladder, which are not insignificant. And I'm not going to comment on which is better or which is worse, um, just that th those are the things that we have to think about. So when we look at prognosis by stage and group, what you can see, obviously, the higher your stage, the lower your event-free survival, and the higher your group, the lower your event-free survival. So you really, the patients who are stage four metastatic disease, group four, um, they really don't do well, but everyone else seems to do okay. All right, let's talk about histology quickly. So embrinal rhabdomyosarcoma, about 90% of all rhabdomyosarcomas are embrinal. And this has generally has a better prognosis and the patients are younger. And here, what has become um, really a, a common thing that, that we're talking about with rhabdo is that there's no trans consistent translocations for this. And this is sometimes called translocation negative um, rhabdomyosarcoma. There are further variants of, of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, like botryoid and spindle cell. And these are very, very favorable. They have even better outcomes than embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. So that's something to remember. And then we talk about our alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. So this happens in 10 to 20% of patients. This has a worse prognosis and the patients are usually older. Now here we have two common translocations that we'll get into. So these are called either translocation or fusion positive tumors. And almost all of the alveolar tumors have this, okay? There, there's one, <clears throat> excuse me, between um, chromosome 2 and 13, where it's a PAX3 FOXO1 fusion. And this, these patients have a significantly poorer outcome, okay, than patients who don't have that. And then there's also a translocation between chromosome 1 and 13 that's a PAX7 FOXO1, okay? So very similar, PAX and FOXO. Um, and these patients actually have a better outcome compared to the other translocation outcomes, but they're still worse than embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, okay? And these patients are the who have um, and then, like I said, we, we have the translocation or fusion negative tumors, and these are most often embryonals. Um, and, and really, the fusion negative alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas, they're indistinguishable as far as their outcomes from embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And these, these tumors usually activate the RAS pathway. So then we talk about risk, and I only included the COG stuff. Um, and this is, this is again, complicated, and I, I have a picture of this on my phone that I refer to that's a favorite um, so that I can very quickly refer to that so I make sure that I'm grouping well. But essentially what you see when you get, when you get into alveolar, um, the alveolar subtype, you're going to be at intermediate or high risk. And when you get into the, you know, potentially – well, definitely the stage in group four is your high risk. And then the twos and threes, you just have to see what the histology is and what the combination is. Then you can see that the failure-free survival. So low-risk patients obviously do great, and the higher-risk patients do much worse. And then you do see, we, we can talk details about the different therapies, but there is an, there is an increased, um, there's more therapies and more combinations of therapies as we go up in the risk category. So treatment for um, G rhabdomyosarcoma often involves a combination of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And when we talk about local control, this is very important, especially from the surgical side. This is, refers to how we manage the site of the primary tumor. And this could be up front before we give any chemotherapy, like a radical orchiectomy, or it could be after we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And really, this is where it's incredibly important for a urologist or a pediatric surgeon to have a conversation with the oncologist about how to make this decision. And often the decision really depends on how both how easily it's done, but also how disfiguring this may be to the patient. As we all know, taking out a patient's bladder and prostate is not a small operation and is going to lead to long-term changes for these patients and their families. Um, 
there, if you don't do local control, you do have a worse event-free survival, but actually your overall survival is the same. Regardless of, of when you need to do surgery, you have to obtain a tissue diagnosis. So you need to be thinking about these things. The backbone of rhabdomyosarcoma therapy is back in North America for COG. That's been cysteine, actinomycin, cyclophosphamide. Psyop uses iphosphamide instead of cyclophosphamide, and they all and they sometimes use an anthracycline as well. Um, their psyop has also introduced maintenance therapy with temsorolimus, which has been interesting. And I'll quickly comment that um, a recent COG study actually has been mod. I don't know if it was exactly closed or it's been modified, but it was initially looking at VAC-VI um, in combination instead of just VAC to try to decrease the rates of infertility related to the cyclophosphamide exposure. And actually that, um, what, we've, what we've seen in the initial analysis is that outcomes were worse. So that combination of VAC and VI has been mostly abandoned um, in favor of just going to back to VAC therapy despite these increases um, in infertility associated with the higher doses of cyclophosphamide. There are several other drugs that are also used. So when we talk about collaborative group study, I think it's really important to kind of take a step back and realize these tumors are rare and the only way for us to improve the outcomes for the patients and to figure out what the best treatment strategies are for them <clears throat> is collaborative group study. So when, for anyone who's, who's junior, when you're really trying to start reading about rhabdomyosarcoma, it can be very complicated. And I think Wilms tumor is the same. When I started reading about that, I was so confused by all the acronyms and I called the alphabet soup of all the collaborative groups. So the IRSG, which is the International Rhabdomyosarcoma Study Group, really merged and now is part of COG. And PSYOP really has kind of always existed on its own, and that really guides Europe and the rest of the world. Um, as Dr. Ziada always reminds me, it's not just Europe. <laughs> so historically, um, early radical surgery was done for these patients. And while the details on the treatment vary, depending on who you follow, COG or PSYOP, those two major groups, um, survival is about the same. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about kind of the differences between the two, because I think that can help you decide, um, you know, which, which approach you like better or advantages or disadvantages in understanding the differences in approach. So if we look at the study goal for COG, the goal is to preserve organs and minimize surgical morbidity, which certainly when we talk about a cystectomy, we, we are causing major surgical morbidity. Whereas PSYOP really minimizes the use of local control and intensifies chemotherapy up front. When it comes to local control, COG prefers radiation, whereas PSYOP um, prefers surgery followed by radiation when needed. The end point that is emphasized in each group, um, COG really emphasizes event-free survival, whereas PSYOP emphasizes overall survival. And part of that is because of salvage. So um, COG initially will accept some more toxic initial therapy because they want to avoid salvage therapy, which can be associated with more complications um, and more surgeries and more morbidity. Um, whereas PSYOP really set, will accept a, a little bit of a lower event-free survival, um, but, and will accept higher salvage rates because with salvage, this, this tumor is very treatable. So when we look at outcomes, so we've got event-free survival and overall survival, COG on the left, PSYOP at the right. When we look at all rhabdomyosarcoma, it, you would, it would appear that generally COG perhaps does a little bit better. But when we look at just bladder prostate, you can see there is a difference in the event-free survival between the two, but overall is similar, perhaps even better with PSYOP. And when we look at non-bladder prostate, it's really quite similar. Important to remember, even though I live in, in the United States and follow the COG protocols, there is no statistical difference based on these protocols. So um, in some ways, you, as long as you follow a protocol, you can't be wrong. And, and deciding which protocol to follow just depends on different individual situations and patients. So local control. So 
as I, I feel a little bit like a broken record, but ex excision of the primary tumor up front when you can is, is absolutely what you want to do, but you don't want to cause any major functional or cosmetic deficits. And the reason why is because if this patient is group one, they won't need radiation. Okay. And, but you can consider re-excision after starting therapy. And we'll, I'll get to that in a second. When we talk about radiation, this typically begins sometime between three and 15 weeks, depending on the individual patient. <coughs> the dose is a hefty dose, between 3,600 and, and about 5,000 centigrade. And it's not infrequent that there are residual masses after radiation. And importantly, there's no difference in recurrence, whether the patient has a mass after radiation or not, which is important to remember. So my, my personal thoughts on this, so COG and PSYOP have equivalent outcomes, okay? I can't, you can't argue that. I personally prefer radiation for local control unless there are very young infants. The reason why is because, the, because of the growing pelvis. I really, really worry about the growing pelvis and freezing that pelvis, especially in the very in the very young. Um, and that, so that's why I would do surgery then. But after that, I think that the idea of potentially preserving organs is, is great. Um, even if, and, and so what somewhat, what many people say against surgery, or excuse me, against radiation is, well, the bladders defunctionalize and they don't do well, so you have to do surgery anyways. And so Yes, that's, that's absolutely can happen, but there definitely is a chance that there will be no further surgery and not every single patient has their bladder um, defunctionalized. And even if you have a bladder that's defunctionalized, it preserves your UBJ and it gives you a plate for your Augment and Mitrofenov over a complete neobladder reconstruction. And I don't think that that's something um, insignificant that we, can, that we can ignore either. So now I, I kind of alluded that I was going to talk about timing. So there's this concept called the PRE or PRE, and it's a pre-chemotherapy re-excision. Again, so the, the decision point of, of grouping happens at chemotherapy, okay? And so the idea behind this is that you potentially have a biopsy or an incomplete resection, but you think you can get it all without... Um, adding to the morbidity of the operation, but you're trying to group reduce to try to decrease the therapy that the patient will need, thus decreasing side effects and late effects. So if after you do a biopsy and the diagnosis, you can completely resect the patient, then it's a very good idea to do this before chemotherapy begins. If you do it after, the group, the group has been set, but if you do it before, that's really the timeline for your group assignment. And the most common place that we see this and consider this would be in patients who have a small bladder dome lesion that you can do a partial cystectomy and lymph node sampling at the same time. And so if you go in cysto bladder biopsy, find rhabdomyosarcoma, and on your um, staging imaging, you can, you can completely resect it. This is a perfect example to do that. And you may potentially spare the patient, make them group um, make them group two, and they may be able to spare radiation. And this is much more commonly applied to non-bladder prostate rhabdomyosarcomas, so it's not something that we as urologists think about a ton. Um, something to remember is even though you think, well, even if I do a cystectomy and a prostatectomy, I can get everything out, remember that less than half of cases have a negative margin with upfront surgery. So uh, as you know, my mentors told me, resist the temptation to offer early extirpative surgery because the odds are against you. All right, so in, in the different protocols, if there is a positive margin, typically the patient will need radiation in some form, okay? So um, if you can get away with the pre, the pre-excision, the pre-excision, um, uh, uh, re-excision, excuse me, or pre-chemotherapy re-excision, um, then you can potentially spare them radiation. Now, there is something called the DPE, or the delayed primary excision. And what this is, is you do your initial biopsy, the patient gets chemotherapy, and then they, they, if they can reduce the tumor size and you can re and you can excise what's remaining with the negative margin after chemotherapy, 
you can reduce the dose of radiation given. So this is where we really see this thought about is in our young infants with pelvic rhabdomyosarcoma. If, the, if you are able to achieve a negative margin and do this um, DPE, then your radiation dose is 36 gray versus about 50 gray if there is gross residual disease remaining. Now let's talk about the potential timing of surgery. So you can, you can operate many times with rhabdomyosarcoma. It can be at, at, at diagnosis, after biopsy, but before chemotherapy, so the, the pretreatment re-excision, or after chemotherapy. And this would be the delayed primary excision, or some people call it an, a slow or SLO, second look operation. Or you can do it after chemotherapy and radiation for salvage local control strategies. So I'm going to very quickly delve into um, some of the more site-specific things. So when you have a paratestis mass, the first thing you need to do is make a diagnosis. And so and everyone will agree, an inguinal exploration is the way to do this. Now, if you have a low suspicion for malignancy, remember that you can excise this <clears throat> with an intraoperative frozen section. Um, COG has uh, very specific wording about um, draping things off using a different set of instruments um, it, should it be positive uh, for closure and uh, re-gowning and gloving? But you can do a frozen section, and if it's not rhabdomyosarcoma, you can potentially stop the operation, put everything back, okay? But if it is, then you are still there, and you can do a radical orchiectomy. Obviously, if you're highly suspicious, you go for the radical orchiectomy right from the get-go. If it is a rhabdomyosarcoma, then you need to do full staging, all right? So this would be a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, bone marrow biopsies or aspirates, usually by our oncology colleagues, and a PET scan. And we can talk about some of the details about this. Um, it used to be that bone scan was indicated, but now with modern PET, um, really that has replaced a lot, a lot of our imaging, and, and it does a really good job in this disease. Um, there's no role for the scrotal approach for any testis or paratestis mass. Um, and if the mass is adherent to the scrotum as you're trying to pull it off, don't hesitate to take some of the, the scrotum with that. You don't want to leave a positive margin. That's probably the most important part of any rhabdomyosarcoma surgery is you want to get the entire thing out on block. All right. So then there's also thoughts about when you can operate adjuvantly for these paratestis patients. <clears throat> so what about RPLND? Well, there are actually two recent publications, one from the SIOP side, one from the COG side, that looked at um, adjuvant RPLND. And they basically confirmed what has already been recommended. So any patient with suspicious retroperitoneal lymph nodes on their staging CT, they should have an RPLND regardless of age. Any patient who's older should have an RPLND because <clears throat> the size criteria of a centimeter doesn't seem to do as well with those patients. It's not as predictive of who will have retroperitoneal disease. And then if you can combine a, an RPLND with a hemiscrotectomy, if you have to, if there was some type of scrotal violation. Then we think about chemotherapy. So you can also, you can co potentially combine a port, an RPLND, and bone marrows in the operating room. So one, don't forget to try to minimize some of the morbidity from anesthesia and whatnot for these patients as well. Also remember sperm banking. Um, these patients, if they get an RPLND and with their chemotherapy, especially cyclophosphamide in North America, and just losing one testicle, it's very important to bank um, for these patients if you have protocols that will allow that prepubertally or even if you have a postpubertal patient. All right, so when it comes to pelvic rhabdomyosarcoma, <clears throat> biopsy is generally the first step because these are usually unresectable um, up front. Biopsy alone would then make the patient group three if you give chemotherapy after the biopsy. But remember, consider the pre-chemotherapy the pre re-excision after the biopsy, but before chemotherapy if you can, because you may be able to downgrade their grouping and potentially avoid more toxic therapies. When we talk about resectability, as I said, pelvic rhabdos are usually unresectable, um, but there are advantages of a complete upfront resection, as we talked about. You can make the patient group one, avoid radiation, but the key is negative margin, so make sure that we don't forget that. And there are also disadvantages of complete upfront resection. 
Um, it's very highly morbid if you have to do a complete exoneration. And if you still have positive margins after you resect, you're, the patient is going to need radiation. So you've then you've done the big surgery, patient needs chemotherapy, and they're gonna need radiation. And this is really all of the worst complications and the, and the setup for the worst things to happen. Um, that's, that's the situation that you, we're in now. So quickly, I'm gonna talk about three new advances. And um, I will say that a lot of this is being um, trialed and looked at outside of the United States. And I think it's great to try to minimize uh, the morbidity of treatment for this disease. So proton beam therapy. We don't have to we don't have to go through all of the urologic complications of radiation because they're definitely significant and we've all seen them and they can be disastrous. Um, but remember that radiation has growing effects on the growing skeleton, which can be really important in our young patients. This can happen years after treatment and it's typically permanent. Um, with the limbs and, and the, the, um, the face, there can be um, major, major asymmetry and um, aesthetic issues that the patients have to have or that, they're, um, that they experience. Um, and for us, usually it's the growing pelvis that becomes our issue. And remember that young patients may be even more sensitive to these side effects. So really trying to minimize them is absolutely reasonable. Now, proton therapy, proton beams allow for more improved targeting. So they, they can deliver the radiation just at, at the tissue they want, not with all the surround, not touching any of the surrounding tissues, essentially. And they can do that three, in a 3D way. Um, and for children, this is super obvious. The toxicity should be way reduced. And no one can argue that this, is, this would be great for our children. Um, and it does appear to have equivalent disease control, and um, it, has, it has fewer side effects. Um, it's still being studied. It's not, it's not completely part of the protocols yet, but certainly is something that very likely will be. Then we can talk about brachytherapy. So we know about brachytherapy for prostate cancer, commonly used, also used for breast cancer. And actually, um, there were some groups that initially looked at brachytherapy and either traditional radiation therapy or proton therapy to decrease damage to the surrounding tissues, reduce the dose of those external radiation um, by combining it with the brachytherapy. And it's a French group that looked at surgery and brachytherapy as local control to avoid either protons or external beam at all. They looked at just under 100 bladder prostate patients um, median age was just over two years. They were mostly embryonal rhabdos, and they had very good follow-up over five years, which is wonderful. And what they did is they, they did the surgery, they resected what they could, and then they implanted plastic tubes transperineally, so through the perineum. And then every day they would take the patient to the radiation suite and put the, the, the brachytherapy rods in, let them deliver their radiation and then come and then they would come out and that was done over several days and weeks uh, maybe even months i'd have to i'd have to look at the paper again and what they showed was that at a median of about a year 12 percent of patients relapsed and only six percent were local failures so this is actually very promising their five-year overall survival was 91 percent and disease free survival was 84 percent which is great just in line certainly in line with um, what we see at the COG and PSYOP study levels. Um, they did find that 15 percent who were without relapse so our 15 percent are survivors they did have brachy related urinary issues that did require intervention and these were very similar to radiation type issues that they had. So this is encouraging not probably ready for prime time yet, but something that's on the horizon. Then we can also talk about diversion after surgery. So classically, if you do a radical cystoprostatectomy on these patients, you would do an incontinent diversion, and then you can convert them to a continent diversion after they have demonstrated durable survival. But there's an Italian group that reviewed their experience. Now, the big caveat here is that these are only 11 patients, but they either did an immediate neobladder versus traditional incontinent diversion followed by a continent diversion after survival. <clears throat> and what they found is that not looking at cancer outcomes yet, but looking at upper tract deterioration, UTIs, things like that, that all the patients who had immediate reconstruction, none of them had upper tract deterioration and they were all continent, okay? 
But in the delayed group, all of them did require some type of either CIC, which makes sense for their pouch, or they had recurrent UTIs or upper tract dilation. And so perhaps this may be feasible. There were certainly issues with um, positive margins on frozen sections and final positive margins. And if there were positive margins, that was very, presented a very, very, very dismal overall survival um, for the patients. Um, but I, I applaud the Italian group for pushing the envelope and trying to look at this. So in conclusion, just wrapping up, make sure that when you see a patient with a pelvic mass, <clears throat> keep a broad differential. Always be suspicious of the quote unquote routine diagnosis. So we see patients with hematuria and difficulty avoiding not uncommonly and be aware that sometimes this can be a rhabdomyosarcoma that's lurking. Take your time to come up with a multidisciplinary plan. Talk to others, Make sure talk to your oncologist, talk to your radiation oncologist, talk to your radiologist, talk, about, talk to your infertility team to figure out how you can optimize the care of this patient before you do anything that's irreversible. And then remember, I was always told to be a doctor, not a technician. So make sure you think about how your decisions impact patient outcomes. So that your timing of your biopsy, combining things with other providers. Well, thank you, Amanda, for this very nice and uh, illustrative uh, uh, meeting. And um, I hope that we can find some questions uh, Maybe Dr. Dr. Haysam has some questions to, to ask, and I have uh, some questions to ask too, but maybe Dr. Haysam will start first. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, Amanda, I'm very interested um, in the bladder prostate uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, and as you have mentioned in your presentation, that in most of the instances for the bladder and prostate rhabdomyosarcoma, they present with large uh, mass at the start of their presentation. Uh, what I'm interested to know, uh, how can you differentiate between the origin of the bladder and prostate uh, rhabdomyosarcoma at presentation, or it is not important at that uh, stage? So that's a great question, and I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. They're often very large and they can be completely distorting that normal anatomy. And it's very, very difficult to tell. And I think that's probably why um, the, the cooperative groups have not tried to differentiate bladder versus prostate because it's so difficult to tell. And really you treat them the same way so I'm not sure that functionally it's necessarily all that important. Um, the, the one situation where it is important is in that rare scenario that maybe you'll see once in your career where you have a dome lesion, where you can excise it, you know, do a partial cystectomy and lymph nodes. But otherwise, it can be very, very difficult. I don't have any insight onto how you can differentiate. Um, I have yeah. found... I like to get MRIs on a lot of the patients because that can tell you, that can try to help you. Um, but functionally, I'm not sure it necessarily matters because they're treated very similarly. Um, Amanda, to continue the, the question, um, uh, after taking a biopsy, whether this biopsy is a cystoscopic biopsy or, uh, or transperineal biopsy from the prostate, for example, and you confirm the diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma, then you started uh, the proper chemotherapy using the VAC, which is a gold standard, as you have said. And then um, uh, my pediatric clinical oncologist, uh, after finishing the chemotherapy, he asks me, because he is following the side protocol, uh, to intervene for the residual mass, which is apparent and present in the bladder, Usually these masses are present at the trigone and near to the bladder neck. So if I go in and try to remove such masses with uh, a safety margin of about 0.5 centimeter at least around, I, I cannot do this comfortably. And uh, I will find the ureter in my vicinity and the bladder neck in my vicinity. And I, I cannot end up with a complete resection. How? Um, I deal with this situation to preserve the blood. So, so that's a really good question. And I think that that's where if you are going to do surgery, 
that your number one goal has to be complete resection. And so if you're going down the surgery route, <laughs> you've, got, you've got to take the whole bladder and you've got it and you're going to take the prostate as well. I think really where the discussion that needs to be had is should you do surgery or should you do radiation? And in, in that situation, you know, your pediatric oncologist who's really driving the boat of being the quarterback, they're going to guide you. But I, I think that one of the one of the worst things we can do is try to you know spare the bladder neck, spare the prostate and whatnot, and end up giving the patient um, uh, not a really good, sound, safe, and aggressive oncologic operation, because then they're going to need radiation, and then you've really you've given them that sort of worst case scenario. Um, I, it's it can be really really hard, and it's a really really difficult discussion to have with people that aren't surgeons because they don't necessarily understand how intimately related yeah. that is and how difficult it is. Yeah. yeah. So. If you are continuing with the COG, not the SAI protocol, after adequate chemotherapy and the presence of such a residual mass in the bladder at the trigone, um, uh, you are going to start radiation therapy or you're going to uh, reassess the resectability of this mass? What, what's your protocol? So, so what it involves is, so I do the biopsy and then um, they get, usually they get radiation and they get the full, their full dose of radiation. Then at their, it's about week 12 or week 16, they get imaging again. And as long as things are decreasing, then the decision is, can you do the delayed primary, the delayed primary excision um, and get everything out with a negative margin and not be dis disfiguring? Okay, or if it's going to be so disfiguring, like a radical prostatectomy and cystectomy, then typically you would continue with radiation and do the whole do the whole dose of radiation and not try to dose reduce them. Does that make sense? Yeah, but for the masses after radiotherapy, which remains after radiotherapy, I know that maturation. I know that maturation can happen and. Um, and the tumor cells can transform into rhabdomyoblasts and the leaving this uh, mass, which is composed mainly of a, a spindle or a stroma with rhabdomyoblasts under follow-up can be done. Do you need to go in again with cystoscopy and take a biopsy to confirm this maturation? So, so what, I, what I would typically do, if after the entire course of radiation, there's still something there and I can biopsy it, um, uh, if it's something easy to biopsy, I would like to biopsy it, but you're right. You end up with that mature rhabdomyoblast and then it becomes, well, what do you do with that information? And I think if you can, if you can resect it and it's not too disfiguring, I think that that's reasonable. Um, <clears throat> but you know, watching and seeing what happens is also not unreasonable because that, that mature rhabdomyoblast is, we hope for any path that is not that, and that's what we almost get. And that, that almost doesn't help us make our decision. Yeah, uh, my last question to leave uh, Dr. Ahmad Shuman uh, with you, Amanda. Um, for the paper coming from Gustave Rossi from, uh, from France, uh, uh, studying about 100 uh, children with rhabdomyoblast sarcoma, uh, they did just, uh, um, a limited resection of the tumor with, uh, with the mucosa around and they did not disrupt the trigonal musculature and at the same time we put the rods of the brachy, uh, of the brachytherapy. Um, uh, what do you suggest? The, the results are marvelous. They studied patients um, in a period of 25 years from 1991 to 2015 and paper published in 2017 I think or 16. Uh, what do you think, if, you, if we have the feasibility to, to do this uh, local limited resection with no mutilation coupled with brachytherapy uh, to minimize the risks of radiation, especially if we are going to use the external beam uh, uh, radiation with all the risks about the function of the bladder and the organs in vicinity. Uh, what, what do you think about this uh, I think it's a marvelous technique with marvelous results. 
I think it's great as well. And actually, when I was a fellow in Denver, um, we had uh, a little girl who had a vaginal rhabdomyosarcoma. And there are places doing this in the United States as well. They can make a little mold of the vagina and they can put the, the seeds in that mold and put that in, in the baby's vagina. And she was, she was able to, we were able to spare her vagina and, and, and the related organs. And that was great for her. So I think, I think it's wonderful. I hope that we can figure out how to do this and study this well. I think it does become difficult. This paper is great and I, and I hope that it works, but realistically to keep patients with plastic tubes in their perineum, like that, that's also, that's not easy. So we have to figure out how we can deliver this. Now it's not just, does it work? It's, does it work on a large scale? And how can we deliver this um, in, in an easier way to the patients? But I think it's great and very promising. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ahmed Shuman with you now. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Heisen. Uh, hi, Amanda. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, every, not every time you do a cystoscopy and you take a biopsy from the bladder, it's conclusive. Even if you scopily, you, you feel like this mass is it's, uh, it's not, it's not benign looking. And uh, maybe you can do a re-biopsy one time or two times, and every time you can't find any malignant tissue inside, even if you're doing immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So what do you think of this situation? Uh, would you consider open uh, biopsy for bladder, uh, prostate rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, or you just repeat the biopsy again endoscopically? So, so this, this is, I, I've actually found myself in this situation in my first year of practice, especially because the, when we're talking about young patients, our instruments are so small that we can't get a nice big piece of tissue. Um, so what I have done in that situation is remember that you can do a truss biopsy. Now, maybe not for little kids, but you could do you know, a finger guided biopsy through the rectum. You can also do a laparoscopic biopsy or you can do an open biopsy. I mean, ultimately, we ha you have to get enough tissue to get the diagnosis. I will put the caveat out there though, if you're going to do an open or a laparoscopic biopsy, take some notes because you're in there and that's gonna give you very valuable staging information. So uh, it's, it's not a failure to not get enough tissue. I mean, it, it happens, it's difficult with these young kids. Um, and open or a laparoscopic biopsy, those are absolutely reasonable, reasonable things, but remember what else you can offer with the lymph nodes at the same time. But would you consider doing an open biopsy for a bladder, rhabdomyosarcoma? I mean, you have to you have to get the tissue. So yeah, I would. And and this and this will not change the stage of the tumor. Well, it may, right? So so you rhabdomyosarcoma is it's one of those tumors that anything that's around it, it you know, potentially it can it can spill and and infect, so to speak, anything that's around it. So you want to try to limit where that would be. So. Um, for the blood, you know, if it's bladder, it's probably going to involve prostate too. So make sure you do an extra peritoneal biopsy. You know, don't violate the peritoneum. Try to limit that spill um, to, to, and contain it and know exactly where it is. Take it from an easy spot. Um, ideally, hopefully it's, if, but if it's a huge mass, it should be pretty easy to do. You could also consider doing it um, um, through the skin as well if you can. But if you need a big piece of tissue, then you may need to. And would you consider at this moment, at this time, to do an excedrinal biopsy if, you, if it's feasible? Would, um, this, would, this, would this get, get the prognosis better? So it, it only changes the prognosis if you get a negative margin, okay? So if you can resect it and get a negative margin and you get lymph nodes, then you've helped the patient. But if it's a, if it's a positive margin, you haven't. So, um, you, you don't want to do something, get a positive margin, and then have this teeny little walnut bladder that then gets radiated, right? So if you, if you honestly think that you can, without decreasing the capacity of the bladder much, you can resect the whole thing, then it's reasonable. But know that that very, very rarely is the case. These are usually massive tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Heisem asked you about uh, what you routinely do for uh, residual lesions for the bladder uh, rhabdomyosarcoma after irradiation. Uh, in, our, in our practice, uh, we just rely on uh, PET-CT and we find if there's uh, any um, active lesions or there's uh, something that's, that's uh, positive in the PET-CT, you just go on and take a biopsy. And if we don't find, we just follow up these patients 
uh, but you just said that you routinely scope these patients and take them take a biopsy from them. So uh, did you see any difference between follow-up or, or, or biopsying them? Do, do, are we missing some patients that uh, should be treated earlier? No, do you understand no, me? no I, don't, I don't think so. I think it, it also depends on your availability of PET scans. Um, and, you know, we, for, for our really young patients, we, our availability is not super great here um, because they need to be sedated and whatnot. So, but PET scans are great if you have access to them. Um, and, you know, they, they certainly, uh, just, just like you said, they can supplement a biopsy. Um, we just, right at the moment, um, have difficulty with our, with our PET scanners. <laughs> and and, and and would the PET scan be of the same, uh, 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 would be great too if it's uh, dealing with the bladder abdominal sarcoma or it's uh, efficacy, it's uh, much less in bladder tumors? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The, the PET scan would still be great for, for bladder abdominal sarcoma too or it's less efficacy is less than other cases? Oh, so PET scans are, as far as I am aware, um, they're very good for most of the rhabdomyosarcomas. Um, the difficulty is, you know, if you have any background activity, which you can, which you can see, um, you know, in the kidney. But if you can, if you, if, if, if it's positive on a PET and you've got an experienced team, um, it, it can be great. But it can be difficult to interpret because of that kind of background activity. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I mean. Type. Uh, what, what's your uh, uh, percentages of cystectomies in the bladder abdomen sarcoma? How, how often do you do cystectomy? Um, so I, I have offered it once to a patient, and that was a patient who was about six or seven months old. Um, and and that, was, that was the only time. Um, and that's really, radiation is really pushed here. Um, and when you talk to parents, it's, it's often hard for them to kind of swallow and stomach a radical cystectomy. So, I mean, I'm, I'm young, I'm early in my practice, but just once so far. And do you do a salvage cystectomy after chemotherapy or radiotherapy, or you, you, you didn't offer this before? Or so, what do you think of this? Right, so with this patient, um, he started his initial chemotherapy and in his 12 or 16 week scan, that's when we talked about it because that's when radiation would have been started. Um, and that's when I had the conversation um, about it. So, and, and the idea is to try to dose reduce the radiation that he's going to get. He's still going to get radiation, but to try to dose reduce. And, you know, I was very honest with that, with that family about, you know, incontinence and erectile dysfunction and whatnot, because if you're going to do it, you got to, there needs to be some kind of benefit. You want to try to dose reduce the radiation they need. Um, so I prefer to do it before radiation, um, but if I was in a scenario where I had to do it after radiation, then I just haven't found myself there yet. But, okay. Uh, what was the, the diversion used in this uh, 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 very young infant? The type of diversion you used after cystectomy? So that an ileal conduit. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, say there, that's, that's I, I think in general, I'm going to generalize a little bit, but I think in general in the United States, that's what most people are doing. Or ureterostomies, but ileal conduit. So, and uh, how often do you see a defunctionalized bladder after uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy? Um, so it depends on what literature you read. Um, in, in some reports, it's in the 50 to 60 percent range. So it's not an, insig it's not an insignificant thing. And I think mm -hmm. the longer that we follow the patients, the more, the more that you see this becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I have got some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, a question is saying that what's the timing for re reconstruction after surgery? Would you do a, a concomitant reconstruction or would you do a delayed reconstruction? Um, so th that sort of, that, that kind of depends. Um, generally I try to do some type of diversion and then wait for the child to become a little bit older to try to undivert them. Um, I I'm generally not, not a fan of doing a, a big, you know, augment neobladder or anything like that at the time of, at the time of my cystectomy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, how would you how would you uh, decide if this child can do a continent diversion to the urethra or not? Uh, because often these patients, yes, they have a problem with their uh, with prostate, and it's very small. They don't have even a prostate or something like this, and maybe you'll be incontinent after surgery and. Uh, I think it would be better for them to do a continent uh, uh, cutaneous divergent instead of doing an incontinent uh, orthotopic divergent. So how would you consider this and how, would you, how can you assess this while doing a re-divergent? Okay, so are you talking at the time of the cystectomy? At the time, you, halas, you finish the cystectomy and you did a temporary divergent for an erectondry or something like this and you're going inside for a re-divergent. Okay. How would you assess that this child wouldn't be incontinent after doing an orthotopic divergent, keeping in mind that his prostatic urethra is very short and the primary surgery is often um, uh, ex ex excessive surgery and you did him, you radiated him too. So uh, what do you think of this? So, so I think for people that are very experienced at this, um, I, I think that it's reasonable. I think, you know, you've got to make sure that you take a nice healthy urethral margin and do a frozen section, knowing that frozen sections are not always correct. There's a high rate of a false negative, excuse me, yeah, a false negative um, frozen section that it's not always reliable. And then I would counsel the family that if it if it turns out that my frozen section was negative, but it was really positive, um, to potentially have a conversation about undiverting him because, the, because you, you need to get a negative margin. That's the most important part of this operation. Um, and so my general thought is that doing a continent orthotopic diversion, I, 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 I honestly would, would tell people to kind of stay away from that, but that's just sort of my own bias. Okay, and uh, would you would you routinely do a frozen section uh, uh, to know the, the residual if there is a residual tumor or uh, tissue in your primary surgery? Um, if if I'm yes yes I would try to do a I would try to do a frozen section for sure because the at least for the COG protocols the whole point is to get a negative margin to reduce the dose of radiation that the patient can can get. So I would, anywhere that I was concerned, I would want to get a frozen section and definitely at the urethra and at, at the ureters, just because that, that's, it's common, that's where we're, we're disconnecting things. I would, or anywhere else where I was concerned, I would try to get a, fr a frozen section. One question is, uh, what's the difference between role of uh, retroperitoneum node dissection in testicular germ cell tumors and uh, paratesticular rhabdomycercoma? Okay. What so do you see the difference between? That's a great question. Um, and actually, I don't know if any of you watched the AUA Live. Um, we talk, Jonathan Ruth from Duke University, who's on the um, COG Rhabdomyle Sarcoma um, Committee, he talked about this a little bit. And, um, you know, if you look at the templates that are outlined in COG, they're really modified templates, okay? So right side is a right side modified template. You can spare the IMA and the, the nerves around there. Um, and really, the, the idea of a complete bilateral template for um, a paratestis rhabdomyosarcoma, you don't need to do that. It's really a modified template, and that's very nicely outlined in the COG guidelines. Um, and if you can nerve spare, that would be ideal. And do you routinely take an adrenal biopsy uh, uh, during this time, during, uh, during doing a retroperitoneal fluid section? An adrenal biopsy? Yes, because I read in some paper something like this that there's a concomitant uh, uh, mess maybe in this adrenal gland. You know, as long as, as long as the adrenal gland was normal, I wouldn't. But I'm interested to hear what, what you read because I would like to read that. I, I just haven't read that myself. I read that there's maybe concomitant adrenal mess uh, that's not discovered in, uh, in the scans and they routinely do an adrenal biopsy uh, while doing um, a unilateral retroperitoneal fluid dissection. But I don't know if this uh, uh, is, uh, any, is of, uh, of evidence or not. Yeah, so I know that that's not in the, C in the COG protocols, but that doesn't mean that that's not about to make its way into it. So that's something I'm, I'll look into it, but it's not something I know in the, in the COG protocols as of right now. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Can we return to the orthotopic diversion uh, for, uh, for a second? And I yes, go you, ahead. If you have a child, uh, five, five year or six year old, and you did uh, uh, an orthotopic diversion after radical cystoprostatectomy for him. Um, I, I have a problem in those children that they cannot void well and they have a, a high residual urine inside the bladder. Uh, 
and mucus inside the pouch is, uh, is very troubling to them. I have children who have uh, ileal chondri and who have also continent catheterizable reservoirs and they are okay we, whether uh, ileal chondri or continent catheterizable reservoirs. But um, orthotopic bladder, children cannot void very well and the high residual and mucus sometimes cause obstruction during voiding. How do you overcome this problem? So that's a, that's a, that's a good, it's a, it's, a, it's a great comment. And I think that that's something um, that we see honestly in orthotopic urinary diversions in anyone. But what makes it really difficult in the young kids is the catheters that can be passed are so small and they have full sensation of their urethra. And I will say that's the issues with that are one of, is one of the reasons why I generally don't love to do those because I think that, you know, it sounds great that you've got a, a bladder that's there, but volitional voiding, <clears throat> is really very, it's very difficult and not common after those patients and they've got to irrigate, but then their urethras can't always accommodate um, a tube that's so big. Certainly in the immediate post-operative period, you'd have an SP tube in, et cetera, but that's not a long-term solution. So to me, actually, that's one more reason why I try to avoid that. And it's, it's a really tough situation that it's really tough. I don't really have any words of wisdom. <laughs> Okay, uh, one question, one last question. It's, uh, what's your protocol for surveillance, uh, cystoscopy after bladder preservation surgery? Okay. Do you do a... So, yes. so really here, um, it, I don't think anyone knows the right answer, all right? So they're gonna be getting their scans um, with the oncologist. And I definitely would want to be looking at those. Any residual mass would mean I would need to take a look. Um, I, I would probably, I, I haven't spaced this myself, so I'm kind of guessing what I would do um, since I'm early in my practice. But I, I would probably be, think, be thinking about doing cystoscopy every three months for the first year or two, and then every six thereafter. Um, and then I can be tailoring down. But the use, but looking at their scans, looking at their PET scans, all of that would help me and, and determine if I need to do anything earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Uh, Amanda, for uh, fertility preservation uh, in those children, which I think is very important, for boys, uh, you, you, you recommend the semen banking, mm -hmm. if you, if, for example, for the cases of paratesticular uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma if you are going to do the radical uh, orchiectomy. So you suggest for uh, semen banking from the, uh, or, or sperm, sperm banking, I'm sorry, from the other, uh, from the other side. Uh, what about girls and how to protect the ovaries in those girls who are going to be irradiated in the pelvis? We are taking the ovaries by laparoscopy upward and laterally outside the pelvis to protect them from radiation. Did you hear about taking the whole ovary and the implant it in um, another part of the body in the, in the arm or, or even doing banking for the ovaries? Uh, how do you deal with this issue? Okay, so this is great. And I, I think that this is, it's awesome that we're starting as urologists to think beyond just treating the cancer because this is really important. And you're right, with boys, this is a little bit easier. And with girls, um, you know, doing an ovarian transposition, what you, what you talked about moving it out of, the, out of the radiation field is great. And actually we are trying to work on starting something here, our own um, oncofertility program where we would be doing a laparoscopic um, oophorectomy and then we send the ovary, it gets prepared, and then they freeze the eggs. And this can, now this has in the United States, become standard of care, not experimental anymore um, for post-pubertal patients, which is great. Still not covered by insurance, but at least this is, this is something that now is standard of care and not experimental. For prepubertal patients, it's a little bit more difficult, but I think being able to potentially offer this for patients before they start is great. We know that infertility is one of the number one cancer regrets that long-term survivors have. And so thinking about this is great. And I, I hope that it will become easier for us to, you know, both get the tissue um, as well as prepare the tissue and, and store it and whatnot. But I, I think it's great that you guys are thinking about that and doing that. I applaud you. For, yes, for the was, PP Pertel boys, how do you do how you do the sperm banking for the PP Pertel boys? 
I was going to ask the same question about the same question. <laughs> okay. So this is a great question, and actually, um, Dr. Ziada and I are trying to get that um, figured out here at the University of Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> so we are not presently doing it because we're trying to work on the protocol. And our reason for not doing it is is a little bit. It's it's a little bit of a money issue with you know who's going to cover the procedure, and also um, the storage issue. But generally, we're trying to. Um, we're going to partner very likely with Human. I can't remember his last name. It starts with an S. He's at Wake Forest University doing a ton of research um, in prepubertal spermatogenesis. And um, we've talked to him. We have his protocol. Essentially, what we would do is do a scrotal incision, pull the testicle up, longitudinal incision along the tunica albiginia, and then the seminiferous tubules that come out, cut those out put them in a test tube that then goes into dry ice and we would FedEx them to him and he would do whatever is necessary to prepare them and freeze them and store them. Um, but that is still experimental. So that comes with a lot of hoops to jump through, IRBs, et cetera. Um, and we're hopeful that we can offer that to patients soon, but, but that's been something that's been difficult. Thank you. Okay, uh, from your point of view, do you think that uh, uterine rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is a favorable is a favorable site too, or it's uh, or it's not favorable? Because uh, what I guess uh, uterine the tumors uh, uterine rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma comes in older ages and it's uh, always uh, advanced and uh, maybe it's metastatic. I don't know how it's uh, it's placed with the vulva and the vagina rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Yeah, so uterine is usually put in that same category as the female genital structures. So it's vulva, vagina, uterine, um, cervical, all of that is put into the favorable site. Um, but just like you said, not all favorable site necessarily will present early and at, at low stages or groups. Um, so it, that's certainly a bad actor within that group. Mm -hmm. And from your point of view, uh, uh, many patients with prostatic rhabdomyosarcoma, they have very large masses and they present with retention. And catheterizing these patients would be uh, really uh, a problem. Uh, what, what do you recommend in this uh, issue? So generally, I, because of it's a tumor, I actually do try to catheterize them per the urethra. And I put in a catheter and leave it in dwelling, no CIC. Um, and I would try to avoid poking any holes in the bladder like an SP tube. Um, and nephrostomy tubes are an option, but you know, people generally, children don't like them. You'd have to do that bilaterally. Um, so I generally will do an indwelling Foley until I can go to the operating room, get my biopsy, and then we'll give chemotherapy. And once that mass starts shrinking, the children usually are able to void. It's really an obstructive issue. So when that, and, and the tumors are, are very chemosensitive. So within, within one or two cycles, they're usually able to void on their own again. <laughs> Uh, there is one last question that I got now. Uh, indications for second look surgery. Uh, do you have an idea about this? Okay, so so this is this is that um, that scenario where you're going to do a big resection and you're going to get negative margins to reduce the dose of radiation that the patient's going to receive. So the key here is it needs to be resectable. Okay, and and not with you know not with too much morbidity. An exenteration, most people are going to say, is too morbid. Um, perhaps doing just uh, just the bladder and the prostate is more reasonable than also taking the rectum. Um, so the point is, it has to appear resectable. That's the big key. Okay. My last question to you, Amanda. Um, uh, what are your criteria that dictate uh, you are going to do an extirpated surgery for the bladder and the prostate after chemotherapy. Okay, so are you saying like a delayed one or after radiation as well? But, uh, after radiation, for example, you decide now we cannot preserve this bladder uh, anymore. What are the criteria for taking this rough decision? Okay, so... Um, I, th I think about this, it's not a hard criteria, but I think about this in younger patients earlier on, okay? And then also in patients where they're, they're either symptoms, they're still symptomatic, so they're still having issues with even after their radiation and their chemotherapy, any salvage procedure, um, 
And, you know, if you've got a mass that just is not shrinking in the way it needs to, then that's, that's telling you that that mass is very likely more aggressive. It's not responding to the typical treatments. So we have to then become more aggressive in our approach. So no necessarily hard indications, but those are the scenarios where I'm really thinking about it. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. We, uh, we enjoyed a lot your, uh, your lecture and the, the discussion uh, today. Uh, thank you very much. We will need your presence with us uh, again and again. <laughs> and other topics of uh, pediatric genitourinary oncology, uh, where we are very, uh, very interested. And I think uh, Dr. Ahmed Shuman also is very interested because he's, uh, he's doing lots of, uh, uh, of oncology with uh, 57, 357 hospital. So uh, we are very interested in, 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 in your practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda, for your patience. Thank you for your uh, straight answers. And uh, thanks, Dr. Ali, that he gave us the chance to, uh, to meet you and, uh, and uh, he listen to this uh, nice presentation. Thank well, you, thank everyone. You so much. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, there were some answers, at least, that were usable. <laughs> no, sure, sure. We, sure, we, we got you. a lot of information from you. <laughs> thank you, and yeah. see you soon, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. And thanks, Dr. Ali. And, and thank you. Thank, thank you, Ali. Ali.